We try to do it a little differently. We try to engage the audience in actual conversations about the issues that are involved, and we have some really interesting results. Real Work has been around over 10 years, and has expanded uh, not just when we started, it was somebody wanted to, to show a film about Norma Ray, which is a great labor film. But uh, when approached by the retirees saying that they wanted to do this, and I, I said, we need to make it more than just a film. You can show that film, you can get it at the library, you can rent it anywhere, but if, if there's a way to make it unique, we need to bring somebody into the picture to talk about the, the issues and talk about what the film depicts. Our first film was a film called Bread and Roses, and it's a film about janitors striking, and we were really, really excited to have the actual organizer come. And so that when people came into the event, they could actually question the organizer about, well, some things in the film are fictional, but a lot of it was based upon real life. And so they could actually question the organizer and talk about the issues of organizing poor workers, organizing janitors, and the challenges of multi-languages in order to make comments. <coughs> and it was a quite a vibrant discussion, and that launched our first uh, uh, Real Work Film Festival. Our goal then was to move into other areas. We then moved into, we served Watsonville, Marina at uh, Cal State University. We have uh, sometimes films at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I work at San Jose City College Labor Studies. We have films there and last year for the first time, we went to Alameda County and showed a film about the forming of the auto workers with the grandson of uh, UAW founder, uh, Victor Ruther. And so that's what makes our film festival, I think, really unique and special. We also are a community-based organization. For example, the United Nations organization often wants to do a film, or there's a group that are involved with women's rights, they want to do a film. So we have them show them how to take on the responsibility of setting up the film, building the audience, and getting the word out in order to make it a successful event. It's really important to get an audience and to have the conversation. Uh, we don't want a passive audience, we want an activist audience. And so we find that when we do the Real Work Film Festival, we have people that are very knowledgeable. Just like the general public though, only 10% of our people are actually members of unions. Yet 90% of our audience, and some of our audience range from 20 people up to 300 people, um, are very much heavily engaged in the struggle for human rights and worker rights. So that's why we are encouraging others to do this. That's why we're gonna start it in Alameda County, hopefully this spring, and continue the work that we've done in other areas. I also wanna bring to your attention, um, there's a website. By mistake, I lost it, so hold on a second. Well, there's a labor studies website that I think is really important. One of the things I wanted to share with you, the, there's an open face database of over 1,500 films that have been set up by the DC Labor Festival. Chris Garlock that has put together an amazing collection of films about workers. And we are always adding to it that we also have traditional films, but uh, it gives you a chance using WordPress to try to write an evaluation of the film. So if there are films that you want and you want to read up on and, and look at, we have a major database available to you. It will also help you secure those films and put that together with you. The importance, though, is really getting the word about worker rights, organizing, and winning these struggles for working people and working families. And film is a great way to do that. Young people today in particular are much more interested in going to a film and talking about it than they are reading books, I'm afraid. And, but what we find is when we get into these films and they talk to the people, we have the technological problem overturned and also we give them an opportunity to get physically engaged with filmmakers. The results have been we've had uh, students at the University of California working on the 9-11 film that uh, uh, Michael Moore did and have toured with different film agencies. So we see people starting to take the media into their own hands, young people, and starting to come out with their own productions today. So we're, we're pretty excited about it. We're involved with peace groups, we're involved with community groups, we're involved with unions, and uh, we're involved with the public. And that's probably the most important thing of all. 
Uh, this year, so what we do as a group, we sit around and preview films, looking at trailers and try to figure out which is the best films we want to choose. Uh, one of the films we're looking at today that I think is really important is called The Waiting Room. It's a locally produced film. Uh, it's about the Highland Hospital, a public hospital in Oakland, California. And it's like 24 hours in the waiting room. This is a, a public hospital that will take anybody regardless of whether they have insurance. And it goes into the waiting room to see these people who wait sometimes seven, eight hours to get their services. But it also shows what happens on the inside of the hospital. While they're waiting there, somebody's waiting for maybe six hours, they're told they're next, and then all of a sudden, a gunshot wound comes into the hospital. And so that person has to be reprioritized. And it goes into the hospital and shows the work that's being done by the workers, and also the challenges of the economic struggle of the people that are waiting and waiting in the waiting room. So we're hoping that might be one of our films. But I encourage you, go to our website, uh, realwork.org is an interesting website. It's For 10 years we've been putting together an archive of all the films and speakers we have. It's a good place as a resource to get behind the, what, the, what the issues are. And oftentimes we have trailers that are available too. So um, I think that's about it for, for me. And, and uh, I want to thank you. If you have any questions, go to realwork. R-E-E-L-W-O-R-K, that's real like the movie reel, realwork.org, and drop us a line, send us a film if you're a filmmaker, or if you have any questions about wanting to organize your own film festival, get to real work. Thank you. Cool. Jimmy, don't you have a union meeting to go to? <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay, <laughs> I think you better uh, get going. Uh, that's about the only thing we'd excuse you for in this uh, forum. <laughs> <coughs> Hello, my name is uh, Noel Kent. Uh, I'm a faculty at the University of Hawaii. And uh, I know Hawaii conjures up all these uh, dreamy, iconic images of uh, white beaches and surf uh, rolling in and all that. But uh, we've also got the population of 1.2 million, uh, many of whom are most of whom are working people, and we, we basically have a, uh, a very, very high cost of living in Hawaii, which is about uh, 30, 35 percent higher than uh, the mainland. Uh, it's even higher than the Bay Area, if that's possible. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's accompanied by a fairly low wage uh, uh, income uh, for, for many people. So. We wind up, uh, we, we have the highest uh, housing costs uh, in the country, even higher, again, even higher than the Bay Area. Uh, we have uh, uh, the highest uh, uh, ratio of, uh, of, of two earner families of working women uh, in the country. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very tough economic environment uh, in which the, uh, many, many families are doubled up or tripled up. I mean, uh, uh, you have, uh, uh, it's a situation in which one has to, if, if you don't have a lot of money, you have to really struggle to, to make a living if you don't have good jobs. Uh, we also have a very long labor history, a uh, very uh, contentious labor history uh, of struggle that goes back uh, to the uh, plantation days, to the sugar and pineapple plantations. Uh, we had uh, uh, decades of of workers uh, struggling to build and maintain, sustain unions in the face of uh, terrific opposition from plantation interests and the government. Uh, there were a number of, uh, of massacres and shootings that took place, uh, you know, when strikes, when, when strikes occurred, you know, 1920, 1936, the number, it, it's a pretty, it's, Hawaii has a pretty, uh, for a very, you know, uh, this is a place that has a reputation as a paradise, we've had a pretty violent, pretty violent uh, history. Uh, and the unions remain, uh, once they became consolidated, they remained pretty strong. Both uh, private and private uh, areas, the hotels are almost completely organized. The, uh, the plantations, which have now almost ceased to exist, were organized, of course. Uh, other areas are organized also. Uh, the public workers, public worker unions are strong. The construction trade unions are 
uh, fairly strong also, even though there's been some inroads uh, you know, lately there. Um, one, a number of areas are really under rather fierce contention these days. One is uh, in the hotels where a number of uh, outside corporations uh, have bought these hotels and Wall Street firms and uh, are interested in busting the unions or else uh, cutting them down to size. So there's been a whole series of actions uh, at various hotels led by uh, Local 5 uh, in Hawaii, the hotel, union, the hotel Workers Union, and which has been supported by other workers such as myself. Uh, the teachers uh, in uh, the public schools uh, are also under uh, tremendous pressure. Uh, at this point, we have uh, what is reportedly a liberal governor, uh, Abercrombie, who basically has uh, uh, cut the wages of uh, the salaries of teachers uh, by 5% or more and has given them what he calls the last best offer you will get and impose that contract offer on them. So the teachers are basically uh, involved in uh, very controversial, very, uh, you know, very contentious uh, disputes with the governor also. So there's a number of areas of, uh, and, and the strikes break out uh, around restaurants, around, around construction, around other areas too. So Hawaii has a rather, uh, you know, uh, volatile labor situation uh, occurring at, at various points. Now the labor fest idea was conceived by these uh, two young people and I think that's very good because you know these are young people who are really getting into it. One is a teacher in the public schools, the other is uh, a young woman who's uh, an employee uh, uh, at the University of Hawaii, and uh, they, in conjunction with Steve Zelza here, uh, decided to have a labor fest in Hawaii. And so we began uh, building for it, and they began talking to people and trying to conceive an issue and an idea. And since education is such a critical uh, aspect in Hawaii, and since it's you know under a lot of uh, there's a lot of stress now over contracts and everything else. And we've had uh, uh, the beginnings of charter schools, uh, some of which uh, have proved to be, how should I put it nicely? Uh, well, I won't put it nicely. They've been fairly fairly corrupt and mismanaged uh, on a spectacular scale. <laughs> we've we decided to make uh, education the, uh, the basic uh, emphasis, the focal point. Of, of the work we were going to do. So we held a labor fest about mm, three months ago at a place called Mark's Garage, which is a great venue, wonderful venue, uh, located uh, in uh, downtown Honolulu. But Mark's Garage is a sort of a slightly bohemian place. It's a little bit jazzy. It's, uh, it appeals to young people, which is what we really wanted. Um, and we invited people to come in and to partake of it. And I think it got some publicity, but perhaps not enough. We had about 50 people, which for Hawaii is, uh, is pretty good. Um, and the main, as I said, the main focal point was education and uh, charter schools and also the kind of problems that teachers and students are facing in the public schools. So first we had a film which really took charter schools apart and explored the, what privatization means uh, and the very undemocratic uh, aspects of charter schools in terms of, uh, of class and race, race uh, profiling and discrimination. Uh, and really provided a very strong critique and a, a point of departure for the talks which followed. And then we proceeded to have a panel of six people, uh, a couple of whom were teacher militants, uh, a few others who had something to add, you know, like myself, about uh, the university and university education. And the highlight was two 
students, two young high school students, uh, probably about 16 or 17 years old, who really talked about their experiences at, in, 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 in the school system, their experiences in the classroom, the problems they had in terms of uh, accessing the kind of education which they needed. And this, this was very moving, it was very profound. Uh, and then the audience began to react. We had uh, our, this interactive period in which teachers got up and people, there were quite a few teachers and people from the uh, education system uh, in the audience and they would get up and talk about some of their frustrations, some of their problems, the aspirations they had as teachers uh, which were being frustrated by the bureaucracy and by the way in which the system uh, function to thwart them. So this was a very, and, and there was some attempt by the panel to analyze how we could move forward on this, how we could achieve some sort of unity between, as a community, between parents, uh, teachers, students, uh, how to build a kind of coalition for educational change which we really needed. But the real highlight of it, I think, were the two high school students who were absolutely honest and absolutely brilliant in terms of the way they presented uh, you know they, their own uh, their own stories of, of, of what what their education was like and the kind of struggles they had to obtain uh, you know a, a decent education in the uh, Honolulu system uh, that, that was really that, that made it that was that was just terrific and so the evening ended and uh, I thought it was uh, I you know, I, had, I had really hadn't expected, uh, you know, such a, such a profound, uh, to have such a reaction, that, that it was really good. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and there was a sense that uh, we needed to get together again, we needed to build something uh, out of this. And, and so after it ended, a, a group of us uh, had a number of meetings in which we talked about how we could improve the next labor fest, how we could basically build for a larger audience, what kind of issues we would tackle, uh, this sort of thing. A natural issue for us at this point is the, uh, uh, the whole crisis around uh, the unions uh, in the hotel industry and, and the fact that there is, uh, there seems to be a fairly systematic attempt to uh, diminish their authority, if not to drive them out of the industry. So I think this is probably where we're going the next time. But uh, what we did uh, is we established a very good precedent. We now have a labor fest in Hawaii. We now have an audience for it. Uh, we now have a team of people who will sustain the labor fest and uh, we are going on to the next one. And as we say in Hawaii, Imua, we go forward. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm uh, Mehmet Bayram, and uh, I'm a part of the Labor Fest uh, or the Labor uh, International Labor Film Festival, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, I believe that the festival that Istanbul, or uh, you know, that we put together in Turkey, has been a tremendous success, much more than we what even we anticipated. Uh, this started about five, six years ago uh, when Steve, uh, Steve Zeltzer, um, after uh, you know, doing his, uh, his festivals here, suggested that a similar uh, uh, organization, a similar festival be held in uh, Turkey. Uh, it came at the right time because uh, at a certain place in history, uh, Turkey had several forces working in our uh, behalf. First of all, in 1981, there was a military coup that came in and killed a lot of uh, revolutionaries, leftists, tortured more than a million people, and left millions of leftists in 1981 unorganized. 
So we have this base of people who were actively, actively organizing and working for a revolution in Turkey that are now, that do not have an organization, that are, let me say, floating around. So we have this base that was ready to, ready to work on this. Uh, the other thing is that Turkey is a very uh, dynamic country. People are very, very curious on anything that happens. So uh, putting a labor festival, especially film, is, a, is a, a point of curiosity. Putting a labor festival in a country that had its internal war and with leftists and a very, very strong leftist culture uh, came all together at a time when Turkey is in a crisis already because of the neo uh, neo colonialism, because of the, uh, the uh, all the policies that are going on in the world in capitalism. So there's a reaction. So all of these came together at the right time, and the organization took off and the festival took off like a wildfire. Today, uh, after five or six years, we have more than 100 people, 135, uh, if I'm not mistaken, last count, that is organizing, just the organization for this festival alone. And that success comes, first of all, in our decision. We said that this festival is going to be free, no matter what. We are not going to charge the workers, the peasants, the people who participate, we are not going to charge them at all. But we will try to get our funds elsewhere so that it would be really free. We wanted the people to participate and participate they did. For the first time in the opening, uh, and it has been consistently so, the opening night in the, uh, in the auditorium, 12, more than 1,200 people uh, standing room only. This is the first night. And then each one of, of the presentations, each one of the films that we got together, uh, it mostly were standing room only, and people were coming uh, unbelievably. Uh, but behind the scenes, the, the work of that 130 or 140 people showed up in a way that the unions are involved. They are picking up a, a piece of the tab. Uh, other organizations, local governments are involved. This is how well organized this thing became. Today, when the festival is out there, you can go and see the signs and the advertisement on the buses, local, uh, local uh, uh, government buses that are run. Uh, local governments give us, the, uh, give us the theaters that this is going to be. And uh, uh, unions are busing in all the workers in an organized way in their own buses, bringing them and then taking them back to their homes. And this is not only the workers, but their whole families. Their children come, their wives come so it becomes an event of discussion an event of a you know social event uh, I believe again going back to the dynamics of Turkey once we had the first festival in Istanbul we were bombarded with requests literally bombarded from villages that we had never even heard about teachers were writing saying that we want to have the festival here in our little village so the dynamics of the whole festival changed from a location in Istanbul, the most uh, cosmopolitan place, to a mobile festival, where immediately after the festival happens, the duplication of the DVDs of the films that are shown are made, and they, these are sent to the most remote places in the country. Uh, today, I believe, and, and when this is sent, the teachers show them in schools. The, again, the local governments show them in their theaters. The unions gather their uh, members and they show it to them. And I believe today, in more, in, as far as the cities go, there's like about at least 15 or 20 cities that this festival goes to. And then uh, internationally now the Istanbul Labour Film Festival is shown in Germany, in Britain, in Cyprus as well. And the plans were to have it in Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan. But un unfortunately the wars started so that's on hold at this point. So it is uh, still uh, uh, developing tremendously. The motto that we started with was that 40 films from 20 countries. It means that we wanted to show 40 films 
Uh, but this brought a big challenge because if you have the f uh, festivals in the United States or in Europe, there is the, uh, the uh, ease of language, especially being in English, most people can understand. But in Turkey, when you bring these films from Japan, from Korea, South Africa, there is a tremendous work that needs to be done for translation. So we have a committee of translators that sit down, uh, first of all, the organization starts the, the whole year round uh, in our mailing list, we, uh, we discuss on which films to show. Uh, people come up with suggestions and those suggestions are, uh, are brought together and then, like me, I'm a representative from the Bay Area. We have representatives in Germany, in Britain, in Italy, in uh, Japan, in, uh, in um, several uh, Asian countries as well. So these requests go, and our task here is to obtain the film and then get the, get the rights to show it. So we start that, and by the, uh, which has started for the next year, by the end of November, we should have all the films in place that we are ready to show. Then the work starts in translation. We have a huge collective that does nothing but translation. Some people just translate it, the others put it into subtitles and then produce the DVDs. Now this is a challenge because when in the places that we show the films, the, uh, the population uh, literacy rate is not that high. And many of the workers that can come to see this and their families, some of them may not even know how to read and write. But we have films with subtitles. So there's a challenge there. So uh, the central committee, let me say, started to send the films of not all the, uh, you know, films in the world, but mostly started to put emphasis on the films that were made in Turkey. But this was a challenge for us, of course, and it's a limitation. L last year, we started something, again, all amateur, all, you know, we're doing and learning at the same time. We did a voiceover of the film that Cosme and Steve uh, uh, created for, uh, for the Fukushima in Japan. And now this opened possibilities, and this year they want to do that more with films that have, uh, you know, uh, voiceovers, so that those could be sent to the remote villages where they don't even speak Turkish. Forget about the re reading and writing, but they, because their native language is Kurdish, and it's illegal to speak Kurdish in Turkey. So, uh, so it's a big, big problem. Yes, you can go to jail for speaking Kurdish. So. So, in this organization, uh, what we first of all dis decided was that this was not going to be a passive festival. Passive meaning in the sense that you come, you watch, and then you go. Okay? This is not. We wanted this to be an activist in, in, in participation with, uh, with, the, with the events that was happening. So, the event starts on May Day. Every year it starts on May Day, and uh, there is a, it's a tradition in Turkey, uh, the May Day is a big day where in 1977, 1976, more than a million people marched into a square uh, to celebrate the May Day. So the, the festival now coincides with that and it opens with going and, uh, uh, m uh, to, the, to the memorials where in 1977, I believe, uh, 76 or 77, a huge massacre happened on May Day. What happened is that after the millions of people uh, came into, this, uh, into the square, be, uh, the day before, they had closed down the high uh, uh, um, hotel there, it's a high-rise hotel, and across from it is the waterworks that was closed down by the government. Nobody could get in, nobody could get out. But the previous day, a secret plane comes in, uh, these are all on a registry, and uh, Americans, uh, American nationals, ha uh, have come out of the plane, and with government help, they had been ushered in, and uh, to those hotels, these are also registered, Americans have registered in, nobody else can come in, and right when the, uh, when the um, May Day celebrations were happening, with heavy uh, rifles, long-range rifles, 
uh, they started to shoot at the crowd and they killed about 20 people and then the police attacked the crowd with tanks and they rolled over people and so on and so forth so that was a big May Day massacre so the festival opens first by going and visiting the places where these people were killed and putting flowers there and then participating in the march as the International Labor Film Festival to show solidarity with the union and the workers that are still uh, living that tradition the people who work in the festival are not only, uh, you know, people who love film, but these are all activists. But one thing that is important is that the, what was instrumental in putting this together is an organization called Halkevleri, People's Homes. Uh, this organization was actually established in the 1930s, I believe, by the government itself. The, uh, the uh, reason for establishing this was that to take culture to the people. This is what the government wanted at that moment because they looked at development, civilization as people who can read, write, who can play music, who can uh, do poetry, theater. So th that kind of an organization was established by the government. But luckily in around 1970s, the leftists, the revolutionaries, actually took over this organization. And they cannot attack this organization because it was established by the government, so they can't openly attack it. But by democratic elections, the left is in control. And this organization has been very instrumental in putting this um, or, uh, the, the, the labor fest together. And so, the, but one thing that's important is that those who work in the festival come from all walks of life, but they are activists. There are some people who only translate. Yes, there are some people, but when you look at their background, they either write in a magazine, they write in a newspaper, they have a radio show, they work in the local government, but they all come together and pull from one angle of it and this whole thing works unbelievably. Uh, unfortunately, uh, five or six months ago, one of the leading translators, she's a professor actually in, in, a, in the university, she was uh, uh, in an accident, uh, in a, you know, the a light rail accident, we lost her, but uh, so, but life goes on and the other, other, her students are still working on it and hopefully this year we will be uh, uh, making more voiceovers but our translators are working the oh there's a there's an advertisement committee a lot of people who do the design who do the brochures all professional uh, completely professional uh, nearly every single national newspaper carries our uh, festival at least about a week before that and they have long interviews they have long articles about it TV stations CNN Turkey carries it uh, uh, even the films that were shown there they go in and talk and they tell people that it is going on please go in there so uh, all these new uh, uh, TV channels national channels uh, carry it so anyway I'll leave it there and uh, if there are any other questions well we'll continue with that then Thank you. Okay, then uh, I will. The person is supposed to be presenting Labor Fest here. Is okay. Then you do yes, it. Yes, I'm going to just quickly. You're going to do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Kazmi Tori. I'm uh, part of the Labor Fest uh, uh, organizing committee. And we have. Um, about 10 active organizing com uh, people in the committee. And Labor Fest, original Labor Fest, <laughs> started um, 1994, which, uh, which was the um, 60th anniversary of San Francisco general strike. And um, particularly one of the <coughs> committee member thought we have to commemorate 60th anniversary of uh, general strike, and they make it as um, uh, sort of a, to use that as a you know tool to educate, memorize, and uh, remember 
and um, you and uh, learn the stuff what happened and use it for the future. So that first labor fest was only you know three four events in a one weekend, and all the events was fit in uh, eight eight and a half by eleven seat. That was the first labor fest um, uh, schedule. After that. Um, every year to get more and more. Uh, last uh, uh, three, four years, we have about 80 events in the uh, month of July. And um, how many? 80. 80, okay. 80 events. And um, uh, unique thing in about a labor fest in uh, San Francisco is we do many different kinds of events. Film is just one part of it. Uh, we do have a neighborhood tour, which go around the labor history, um, <laughs> which include the bus tour and the boat tour. And also, um, we have um, uh, uh, play or musical things. We, this year, we had um, Ray Cooter. Mm. Yeah, helped open us, you know, open up the uh, Bloody Thursday, which was um, July 5th, mm -hmm. 1934, mm -hmm. that the two workers were killed for the strike. Mm -hmm. And uh, that um, triggered the San Francisco general strike, and that general strike triggered to make the San Francisco as a union town. So quite a very uh, <coughs> important uh, event in the 1934. Um, so now we have, uh, um, we meet uh, once, a, once a month, year round, and uh, plan this uh, schedule, which involves in not, uh, not just we, like a labor first committee, present this or that, but all other organizations, they create their own events related to labor history, labor culture, and um, become a part of the Labor Fest. And that way we're able to only, you know, the 10 members can able to create about 80 events in uh, well, one month. And so uh, next year will be a 20th year and uh, we're planning to do some big events. Yeah, hopefully, but <laughs> uh, so, um, and uh, Liverfest is all the inclusive, uh, it's an inclusive organization. Anybody can participate uh, who want to help. It's all, you know, volunteer, organizing committee is all volunteer organization. So um, they can attend, anybody who can attend uh, who want to help um, create uh, events in the labor fest. So that's my report. Thank you. So any uh, question, maybe? <laughs> or anybody else who want to talk more? So do you have something planned, a direction? <coughs> uh, next year? Next year. Uh, at, at this moment, we don't. We have, uh, you know, at this conference, we have several other committee members attending, and uh, so. Uh, but we will start meeting, you know, planning from um, September <laughs> this year. But we don't. We are still process of uh, setting up. Yeah. I'm really thinking that in terms of. Uh, the general, uh, the economic crisis, the uh, destruction of so many jobs, the, uh, the fact that unions are on the defensive in the United States and in other countries uh, at this point, that the Labor Fest uh, is a tremendous opportunity for us to really especially uh, approach young people uh, who really don't know the history of unions and how, how important they've been in, you know, in, in, in raising labor, uh, you know, living standards for people. It becomes a real instrument for us to, uh, to assert a progressive politics and a way of counter, countering those who would like to, uh, you know, really uh, 
put down not only unions but also uh, diminish the, uh, the quality of life for millions and millions of people around the world. Uh, Labor Fest potentially is a tremendous instrument uh, for progress in our society. I got a question. Uh, I was listening to the KPFA uh, some months back, and I heard a Labor Fest show being broadcast on the radio. You know, it was about privatization of uh, education. And I'm wondering if you guys uh, have outreach programs in your uh, Labor Fest to uh, interface with radio or other ways to. Uh, get some of the uh, information from Labor Fest out to a, a radio audience? Well, not only radio, but uh, uh, the organization that is uh, working around the Labor Fest in Turkey, I, I can speak of that one, uh, they, they also have, um, they are publishing like three magazines they have a what's called the Syndicat TV, means Union TV. That uh, uh, it's like a mini YouTube, let's say, but geared more towards the labor issues and you know the progressive issues. So those, and they have people working in the radios that work with the organization. So th there's that relationship. But uh, we we used to have uh, micro radios that were uh, you know geared towards that, but because of the eco uh, because of the political climate, it, it was geared more towards music. In Turkey, you have to be very careful on what you say and how you say it. So instead of saying it directly, people would play music. And it's like, I'm playing this music, and you understand what I'm saying, and <laughs> the other people understand what you are saying by the type of music. So the relationship was like that. So, uh, but privatization is a very important issue, and that has been actually that has led to many, many confrontations with the, uh, of the people with the, with the government and uh, those who are privatizing. And many films uh, do go into that one. I believe the new issue right now is privatization has been handled very well. I believe, but now it's the nuclear uh, uh, nuclear um, uh, power plants that they are trying to build in Turkey against uh, mm -hmm. the tremendous resistance from the people so that's one thing but the privatization has been has been handled uh, even after what happened in Japan they're still building they, plants? they are now uh, accelerating it they are accelerating that's, it that's crazy that's crazy yes Very good question. Thank you. Now, the government and government. Okay, which one? If you have the national government that's tremendously reactionary, fascist, uh, openly fascist government, but the local governments can be different. That's why Turkey, I'm going to say something now, I'm sure none of you know, is that more than 50% of the local governments are either in uh, you know indictment or in jail or under they are going to court even as we speak show me another country that has this the local more than 50 percent of local governments are now being charged with terrorism with this with that so that shows the divide between the national government and who the people elect as their local governments is especially in the in Kurdistan there is not a single person left who was elected they are all in jail accused of being terrorists or the civilian uh, face of terrorism so that's why the difference between the national government who clamps down and the local governments who try to help as much as possible union structure it uh, it is much different from here. Uh, it used to be much, much different, but it's now becoming like an American type of uh, what we call yellow unionism. Uh, 
is that uh, there is a, the biggest union now is Turkish, which was uh, established by CIA in Turkey in 1950s because they decided that if Turkey is going to have a unions, it better be controlled and it better be under the under the full you know uh, framework uh, that the CIA puts in. And of course, we know how they. Uh, operate there, just uh, a you know picture copy of the American unionism. But uh, in 1960s, people who rejected this, the workers who rejected this, and saw that they were being sold for right and left, they left the Turkish and they established the Revolutionary Confederation of Workers in Turkey, and that took off again like a like a uh, you know fire. And of course, in 1981, coup. The first place that the government attacked was this union. They killed its leader. They tortured, un, uh, uh, you, you can't even imagine anybody that was involved in it. That uh, They were jailed, they were uh, beaten, they were killed, they were tortured. And now that uh, oh, the, the whole assets of that confederation has been confiscated and the government refuses to give it back. But now it has been established again, but of course with no funds and tremendous government, uh, you know, uh, uh, pressure, they can't do much. And of course they now created a um, Muslim, uh, Muslim uh, confederation of workers. And if you are working for the government, then they force you into those. And if you don't, if you don't get into those, uh, that uh, confederation, uh, you better be careful. Things may happen to you. So. I don't know if that explains the picture. Thank you. <laughs> the situation is teachers in Turkey and Hawaii. The union, um, I don't know if they have separated the union teachers uh, in Turkey. Of course, yes. Can you speak a little louder? I'm sorry. <laughs> So, uh, what's the situation of these teachers in like public education in Turkey? In Hawaii, it's pretty much similar to what we have here. Because we're struggling right now with tremendous budget cuts, and they want us to give up more and more and more. What are you doing to the line? Because now a lot of teachers ask you. So, what's the that, that's why our labor fest, uh, that, that, that's a great question too. That's why our labor fest, uh, you know, the one we had a few months ago, was so significant because basically it. Uh, uh, it brought teachers together who really talked about the sort of grievances they have, not only over, not only over salary and uh, you know benefits being cut, but also over the fact that the uh, the quality of education uh, is uh, is being sacrificed uh, in these budget cuts. And then we had these students who appeared at Labor Fest who really talked to their own lives as students uh, and the fact that their education and the quality of that education is being you know sacrificed uh, in, in this process. So. That's why you know the labor fest was a sort of breakthrough. You know, it was the first time that we've we've the union hasn't done much in uh, aside from uh, uh, wrangling with the governor about uh, the contract. But this is the first public real public discussion where teachers and, and students were able to really voice their dissatisfaction and their frustration uh, with the educational system. And uh, this is something that we have to really build on uh, in the future. So so we see this as a real instrument. Labor Fest in the future, Labor Fest uh, 2013, Labor, Labor Fest 2014, uh, in building on education and other labor issues. Uh, one of the sectors that's most hardly hit in Turkey are the teachers. In 1970s, the teachers union was uh, one of the most revolutionary, the most progressive uh, union in Turkey. And of course, uh, they, it was part of the DISC, the, that revolutionary confederation of workers. And together with the attack on DISC, the government attacked the teachers uh, at uh, unprecedented levels. Uh, today, though, again, the teachers are the leading, uh, together with actually the healthcare workers, including doctors and uh, nurses that are organized, they are one of the leading forces uh, of democratic struggle. But economically, they've been devastated. Uh, there were many, many reports that you know when you have a bazaar or you know when you have the uh, like the farmers market, we have market after they close and they throw away the rotten uh, uh, vegetables, 
Many reports show that teachers go in just to pick up those rotten uh, uh, fruit and vegetables to be able to feed their families. So this is the level that they are in now. But more than that is that the, uh, the most recent uh, oppression is the uh, uh, Ministry of Education has started a campaign of uh, uh, just uh, ratting on your neck on the teachers. They have opened a special line so that you can rat on a teacher. You don't have to prove anything. All you have to say is this, I think this teacher is inclined towards terrorism. That's it. That teacher is finished. They call you again and again and again to uh, questioning and they uh, ask you, they may go to your uh, students and then they ask them, what is this teacher? Th you may be a math teacher, does not matter. Does he talk about terrorism? Does he talk politics? What does he say? The examples that this teacher gives in class, are they political? Is he saying anything? So things like that. So now there's tremendous oppression on teachers and they are, they are really scared because there is nothing else you can do. The Turkish police force has been taken over by, uh, it's a government institution, but it has been taken over by the Islamists that is being provided by the government itself. So it is like a mafia, an illegal organization, the police organization itself. It is led by somebody who lives in the United States. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a religious person uh, that CIA gave reference to so that he can stay in the United States. He has schools, private schools, the most in the world. In Afghanistan, he has more schools than the Afghan uh, uh, Afghanistan's uh, uh, public schools. Clinton goes around the world. Bill Clinton goes around the world to each uh, country and asks them to allow this man to come in and open private schools there. They are all religious schools. In United States, they bring to teach English, they bring Turkish people to the United States so that they can teach English to the, to the uh, American students. But of course, this is not about teaching. This is all about organizing, all about making money, and uh, channeling it, uh, fun, uh, funding the Islamic uh, fascist uh, movement. And the police is just uh, uh, the police force in Turkey is controlled by this person. They, if you want to be a police, uh, you know, in Turkey, first you have to go to an initiation of several years living in their homes. You have to live in a like a dormitory home where you have to prove yourself. Do you pray every day? Do you read the religious? Do you sometimes go in and maybe drink a beer? You are finished. So they they completely organize this from the roots, from the very bottom. And education is under their control and police force is under their control. It's scary. Any other questions? Just one thing I forgot to mention is that I think last year the number of people that watched the films in Labor Fest was over 30,000 in Turkey. So they reached over 30,000 people. So it sounds like Labor Fest in Turkey is one of the one of, is, a, is a tremendous instrument for resisting oppression and resisting the the, the growing uh, suppression of Precisely. any kind of freedom of voice. Precisely. That's, that's we we cool. had one problem though. We were passive. So we wanted to be active. So now there are workshops on teaching, just like you said, students and, uh, and uh, just anybody, youth especially, to make films. And we are showing that how to do that, how to put together. We have yet another problem is that mentally, Turks look at film as a very, very like high, artistic, such unreachable thing that whenever they produce, they go into this uh, instead of simple, good film, they try to be so artistic that they don't say anything. It's just pictures coming, music playing, colors changing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we're working on that part of it. And many of the people that I uh, talk to that, uh, who are producing films, they just you know, like squint their eyes and say, we are influenced by French cinema. So <laughs> we got to change that attitude into a working 
<laughs> class uh, film uh, industry, I guess. Yeah. Oh, man. Tell me, uh, has any of the authorities come and looked at this? Well, no, but they they are keeping a close look on it because they know they know exactly. I mean, one time a friend uh, uh, they were doing something that's related with this uh, is that uh, uh, the police uh, kind of arrested them and they said, look. We, we know what you're doing. You are like so many people, like 80 people or so. It'll take us like two hours tonight to pick you all up. So, uh, quit it. Don't, don't do it. Yeah. It wasn't related to the, to the, to the festival, yeah. but this is how close they keep an eye on you. So. What if you begin to organize out of the festival? And uh, th at that point, you become much more dangerous to them. Tremendously. And at that yeah. point, the crackdown may, may oh, come. Oh, yes. I mean, you forget about organizing. I mean, today, Turkey, I mean, United States, uh, uh, United States criticizes China for its human rights abuses and so on and so forth for journalists. I think, uh, you know, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. Turkey has a number one. Turkey is the number one country that has journalists in prison. And they have not been charged with anything yet, except for terrorism, of course. And there is not a single, not one single uh, uh, evidence. Uh, government has illegally gone into their computers. They have illegally stolen the files of a book that this journalist is writing, which is actually on the side of the government. <laughs> but even that doesn't is not enough. So a book that you are writing that has not been published can get you into prison. And they are in prison more than now about a year and a half. They are in prison, and uh, uh, so this is this is this is what happens. So I leave it at that. And this is the moderate Islamist. Uh, of course, the democratic Turkey. That's a model <laughs> to the world. Yeah. <laughs> One thing. Oh, sorry. So this labor fast we have there, there, there. Do you think to kind of unite? I think they are related and Steve is working hard to get that under maybe one roof or a more close relationship. But we are cooperating uh, at each level. Like uh, Stephen Cosme has helped tremendously with the films that they found, we've sent it to them and we sent the films that we found to them. So it is working at a, at a, at a level. Yeah, you know, one thing about that Turkish labor fest, it took about 10 years to actually, you know, see them pushing, pushing, and it took 10 years, but once they started, it's boom, you know, it's um, biggest probably among all the other labor fest, I mean, as far as the number wise they can, you know, uh, attract. And uh, what we do in, uh, most of the labor fest are film festivals, which is, uh, co compared to, you know, the, all the other events, which is a little bit easier to do a just collect the film, but it's, that's the one way to start, you know, start the labor fest. And what we do is, um, like we, we, in the San Francisco, we get the documentaries, and, and the, some of the good ones, we go to, the, some go to Korea, go to Turkey, go to, you know, um, Europe, different parts of the world to show it. And so in that sense, we are all connected. And some of the uh, film in uh, like a Turkey, uh, Turkish ads, then uh, we get the, the film. So uh, the uh, communication among them, are, I think it, it's there. Uh, it's gonna be um, difficult to have just one labor fest in under, under one roof, because a labor fest is like each different local, each different area has different history and they should celebrate and learn and you know in each different uh, uh, district so those people are directly able to participate and although uh, because of the organizers can get together and uh, like uh, the other the, the, this film festival some of the you know other labor fest organizers get together and they discuss and that kind of thing. But the film fest, I mean, uh, labor fest itself is um, should be, in my opinion, probably locally organized. That, so. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? Yeah. That it's uh, it's grassroots. It comes from the bottom. It's democratic. And maybe the labor fest just happens to be 
the sort of model of not only uh, labor fests, but all kinds of local initiatives to resist uh, the oppression of the system and to, uh, you know, the, the sort of Arab springs that, uh, that spring up across the world where people begin to reassert their, their democratic heritage and their right to participate in their futures. So maybe the labor fest is the model of the future for how we have to, you know, build, a, build democratic progressive societies. Any other questions? Then I think that concludes this workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you.